sock is the only thing that stands between you and uncorking something else besides creativity. So I will get on with it. Oh. Scientists who study astronomy, I mean the outer space, are astronomers, but scientists who work 100 to 200 feet over the top of the planet are called arbor nuts. I am an arbornaut, so that is a new term for you. You can use it at your cocktail party tonight. I'd like to have everyone who's ever climbed a tree stand up, just quickly. Oh my gosh, woo! So we have a lot of arbornauts, thank you. You may sit down. It's just really exciting. There's something special about climbing a tree. I think it brings us back to nature and our roots, and obviously, yes, I'm passionate maybe more about being a mom than a scientist. And so today I'd love to share a few things with you about how that really works. Thankfully, things have changed a little bit since Marie Curie's day. She was a bold lady, I think, to always be the only woman in all of those male gigs. But I do think you've already heard a little bit about the fact that we still have a very underrepresented gender in our girls in science. And there are 51% approximately of women on the planet throughout many different countries. And yet, even in our very own developed country of America, less than 10% of women occupy leadership positions in almost all aspects of science. And on average, women make two thirds of what men do for the very same jobs in science. So we really do need to support girls and we need to figure out how we can move forward from those days of Marie Curie. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg wrote a fabulous book teaching women how to better cope with the workplace. Uh, I wished I had the salary of the COO of Facebook, uh, but on a lesser scale, I wrote a book for women around the world, and um, I will call my title Climb Up instead of Lean In, because my hope is that I can influence one at a time women in different countries, especially developing countries, about the real importance of forests. And in places where I work, like Ethiopia, India, and in this case, some of the Asian countries, we don't have even 5% or even 1% of their population of women engaged in science, just because the cultural mores for them are so challenging. Uh, this is my geeky life, truly. I was that nerd that we just heard about, and it was really awkward for me in school. I was also very shy, and uh, it's amazing to think about this, but in the 1950s, scuba gear was developed, and it absolutely threw open that wonderful field of coral reef biology. Actually, in the 1960s, NASA developed the technologies to go to the moon, but it wasn't until March 4th, 1979, when I had a little $300 rope and harness I made from seatbelt webbing and a slingshot that I actually made in the shop at the University of Sydney that we first went into the trees. I and a couple others went up a tree after foresters had studied them from the ground for hundreds of years or cut them down to study the tops. And lo and behold, we found out that over half of the species on the land part of our planet live in the tops of trees. So in your very own backyard, you have an amazing amount of biodiversity if you have a tree. And I'm looking around this neighborhood poor went winery, there's not too many trees out there, but we'll work on that. Uh, so this is an amazing little tiny bit of technology. Yes, a bit of engineering going on to design some of this equipment, but it's illustrative, I think, of the fact that there's still so much to discover in science. And yes, girls can climb trees, which is really exciting. I actually have a team right now of students in wheelchairs who are climbing trees with me. And last summer, they discovered eight new species in oak trees in Kansas. So yay for them. <laughs> uh, and again, I think the empowerment that going back to your roots about trees for me is something that maybe can help women in science, can help also boys in science, can help all of us think about the ways that we need to relate to our environment and most of all, how much we need to save what we have. In the case of forests, we depend on them for our lives. Healthy forests equal healthy humans. They provide us with 
control for climate. They provide us with fresh water. Pollinators live there. They provide us with foods that we eat. Obviously, they're the coolest and biggest little machine that takes the sunlight and transfers it into energy for all of our life on Earth. And they also produce medicines and timber and so many things that are important to us. So we really, really do need trees. And yes, I'm a tree hugger, but I also use my trees, I hope, as a hook for women in science. Um, I'd like today to just give you a little sense of my geeky background. Sometimes it's really important to show other girls that yes, you too can maybe be a scientist. You don't have to be some wonderful person with parents who were Nobel Prize winners. And secondly, I'd like to talk quickly about what parents can do to encourage your children and also what other women need to do to mentor our girls in science a little more. Uh, this was where I grew up. I had no California Academy of Sciences in my very small town in upstate New York. I didn't even have any access to the Smithsonian Institution, but I had this great big nature museum called the Backyard. Remember those? <laughs> and nowadays, kids don't really go there, but that was a wonderful place where I collected wildflowers. My friends made fun of me. I collected birds' nests. They all went under my bed, and in the winter, the mice all lived in them, and my mother didn't like that, but my parents were so kind to at least tolerate my love of nature. So in fifth grade, shy and geeky as I was, I took these wildflowers that I used to press in the phone book. Do you remember those days when phone books were paper? Oh my gosh, they were so great for pressing flowers, but you can't do that with an iPhone. Uh, so I had this, that's a good point. We better call someone on engineering that. Uh, in any case, I went to the New York State Science Fair, surrounded by what looked to me like 499 boys, mostly with volcano experiments. And lo and behold, I got a second prize. So, oh, that was so amazing. I was too shy to even say thank you to the judge. But when I got home with this little plastic trophy, in the eyes of my very non-science family, I think it catapulted me to the level of Marie Curie. So it really inspired me to think of a career in science. So all of these numbers, however, were really daunting and, and kept reminding me that no, girls shouldn't do this. I never had a woman teacher. I never had a role model as a woman because I think I'm just a little too old. And in those days, they weren't around. Uh, so I looked in the family tree thinking, maybe there's science genes in our family. We come from Lauman, New York. If you've ever been on Route 17 between Buffalo and Elmira, the only thing left, I'm afraid, is a sex shop for the truck drivers right now. But it used to be a really nice rural area with all sorts of things. But in looking at the history of Laumans in Lauman, New York, there were 178 of them, I found out. There were absolutely no scientists, except for a little tiny creativity during the prohibition when they took the corn and they made something with the corn. So I kind of thought maybe that's a bit of botany in my family history, but maybe just a little. Um, so in any case, getting through high school, the geek that I was was OK. And on to college, I was pretty excited that I would meet a lot of women interested in science. I did end up going to uh, Williams College as the second class of women. I should have known better. I started to major in geology, but I was the only girl in that class. And when I got to geology field camp out in Idaho, all the guys loved to throw their rock hammers at birds and try to hit them. So I was so horrified. I thought, maybe I better switch to biology. And Anyway, I did major in biology, that was okay, but it was still a very male-dominated world in that undergraduate day, so I eagerly went off to Duke University to do a PhD in forests, my favorite subject, got a full scholarship to the forestry school, and you guessed it, got there, and there was only one other female in the whole school of forestry, or now it's called the Nicholas School. So. That was pretty disappointing, and even worse, she eloped with my advisor the first year I was in. <laughs> so enough of Duke, enough of Williams. I actually got a scholarship offer to go to Australia, and I thought, maybe I really should marry my college sweetheart, but I think I'll just give this a try, because wouldn't it be fun to see koalas, and I'd never been overseas, and really, uh, it would have been an experience of a lifetime to see some of these cool trees in Australia. So there I went, 
and I did see koalas, and I swallowed a lot of dust driving up and down from Sydney University to my rainforest that I wanted to study. And there were no golden arches, but there were crocodile and chips and kangaroo burgers and all the roadside stands. So you could really have a great diet over there if you love it. Um, anyway, this Australian gig was also a big shock to me because it's actually a very male dominated country. And I was so surprised, despite the fact that I got my PhD and climbed hundreds of trees, but a lot of the pubs that I saw on my road going back and forth to the rainforest excluded women. They were men only. And the country in general was very, very male dominated. My chair of the department called me in one day and he said, why are you doing this? You're working so hard and you'll only get married and have children. So it was just really amazing that there was so much kind of persuasion in the other direction. But I did persist. I actually designed the first canopy walkway pictured here. I made a lot of discoveries about oh, But I didn't patent it. If only I'd patented it, I, could be, I wouldn't be here now. <laughs> um, and I also discovered a lot about tree diseases and got involved in a lot of global forest work. But I was so humbled by all these men around me that I thought, you know what? I think I should get married, and I did do that. I married a sheep farmer in Australia. I had a secret plan. I thought, I'll have my own dowry because they had 5,000 acres of trees and sheep. Um, so here I am out there trying to moonlight as a scientist because, again, it was even worse in the outback to try to think that a woman would ever do anything but cook and sew. I have a lot of recipes for lamb chops, so you can talk to me later. And here's my tree dowry. But again, it just really didn't work. And in the end, um, I brought my children back to the States as a single mom, was so happy to have science without guilt because I had all of these expeditions where I was feeding my babies and trying to collect the data and really cope and it just felt good to be a little closer to mom and dad who were so good to me and babysat on occasion and not have quite that same sense of cultural more that I experienced in Australia. But honestly, I got a great education and I learned a lot about time management, balancing children and data. So anyway, the one joke that was always going around in my lab was, well, Meg, take your kids up the tree and risk their lives, or will she leave them at the bottom of the tree with all the poisonous snakes? I guess you know what the answer to that was. So back in the States was great, uh, but now my research switched from Asia, Australia, to being South America and Africa. And a really cool expedition came up that I was so anxious to compete to get a position in to go into Africa with hot air balloons led by my French colleagues. However, I signed up as M. Lauman. Do you know why I did that? Yeah. And I got in, and there were 49 men plus me. And when I arrived, they said, M. Lauman? Oh my gosh, we thought you were Maurice, or something like that. So it was really amazing. But Again, just getting used to these ratios, I have to say that over time, there's my little hammock on the end. There were 49 others. I'm so good with snoring field colleagues. I'm very used to the smell of socks after three weeks and a platform in the middle of the lowland humid forest. And again, these became colleagues for life and just reminded me how I need to help women get a little bit more involved in science if I possibly could. So. My latest project, for better or for worse, actually has a good ending because it's proving really important to be a woman in this case. Um, I am part of uh, a team of two, a colleague that's local, and we are virtually saving the last 5% of forests in Ethiopia. I really care about this because we work a lot in places where it's not as urgent, but this one is so urgent, and the key to this situation is that the remaining forests are in the churchyard. So my partners now are the Coptic priests. And in all fairness, I believe they like working with me because I'm a female and I'm by myself and there's a real trust that we've built up. So for once in my life, being the lone female scientist is probably to my advantage. And as this picture illustrates, I've been educating them because they don't have computers, they don't have books, they don't have anyone saying, did you know the trees are part of your freshwater spring supply? Did you know the trees provide pollinators? Here's a picture of their landscape. Can you see those little green circles of forest with the church in the middle? It is extremely urgent in this case. And when you look a little closer, we've been able to calculate the shrinkage 
very obviously, probably about 10 years to go because cattle are getting in and eating the seedlings. The farmers don't know where the boundary is, so they just kind of push those edges back in their hope to create a little more food for their family. So this is what I call really urgent forest conservation. The good news is with this priest and one lone canopy biologist partnership, uh, we've been able to come up with a wonderful solution, a win-win-win as we say. We're building walls around the churches. The stones come from the fields, which raises the uh, production of the crops, and the priests are thrilled, and the villagers are thrilled, and we pay a little bit of a donation to the church. So we've changed the culture where all the priests want a wall now, which is a really, really cool thing, and I'm so thrilled about that. So my last big challenge in Ethiopia is how do we tackle the next generation, the stewards of the forest, because these kids, again, don't even have pencils in their school, much less a book or any way of learning about things that we all take for granted in our biology classes. So stay tuned, but I have an MOU for life, so I think we'll be able to tackle something in Ethiopia very soon. I'd like to just quickly talk about how parents can help your children. I think it's critical for all of us that we take our kids into nature. It is so, so important. I think back to my mom taking me bird watching. She didn't even own binoculars, but she made me feel like it was the coolest thing to do. And thanks, mom. It was just really great. And I think for all of us, if you do or don't have kids, you can take someone's kids into nature, which is really <laughs> important. And let them get muddy. We have an antiseptic feeling about our children. I know my kids probably ate a lot of earthworms and a lot of dirt too, but maybe it helps your microbes and makes you healthy when you're an adult. So these are things that I think we, as a 21st century society, really have to think hard about doing. And so as a parent, a grandparent, or just a friend, I hope you'll take children to nature and teach them about using their five senses because we lose that a little bit with our computer and technology world. For women, I think we have to think as well about a global community and for fathers and mothers too. Here are my children in Ethiopia, which is really important for me to think about serving. We also have to really, really get women to empower other women. I missed so much not having a role model in my youth, but now I go out of my way in every country I work to try to mentor women, and in this case, here are my women in Assam, northeastern India. They all would love to be scientists. They have arranged marriages and saris, and here they are. We snuck some blue jeans over there and taught them to climb trees, and they are so empowered when they get opportunities like that. Um, I just came back from a Fulbright in Ethiopia mentoring women at Jima University. Again, no women professors, just lab technicians, but this is the first time they ever even had an event held in their honor. So I feel that there's so much we can do with just a little bit of our time, taking our books, taking our tools, sharing our stories, reminding them that it's a global committee, all of us women in this together. And I'm really proud of this young lady, Tizizu Sise is coming to the airport tonight. I have to zip after this talk because I'm sponsoring her and she is the first woman from Northern Ethiopia who will get a degree in women in the environment. So my latest thought is, yay, <laughs> touch women that will in turn touch others. So I think that's important to think about. Um, so in closing, I just wanna say, let's think about 2050. I'm in a wheelchair, I'm 95. I'm going back to the California Academy of Sciences where today, by the way, I was the second woman they ever hired in science. 163 years of history. In 2050, there will be 25% of the population eating insects because our diet will change. There will be probably only 5% of primary forests left everywhere, unfortunately. And there might be amazing Burmese pythons, as that picture at the bottom illustrates, all the way from the Everglades to Canada because the climate will be so much warmer. So invasive species might dominate. But the good news is I notice when I'm there, 75% of the women, of the staff in science are women. So this could be an exciting change and maybe we'll start thinking in 40 years or 30 years time, where are all the boys? And so I'd like to close 
pay homage to my two boys. Like the last speaker, I have two boys. I'm happy they're in science, but I'm also thinking to myself, we need both genders in science. We need science. We need bright young people because science equals solutions. And right now, our planet has a lot of challenges that require all these bright youth of either gender. So in closing, I'd just like to say climb up, yes, for both boys and girls. And I also, because I'm a mom, I get to give you my motherly advice as my last little will and testament. But this is what I've learned as a woman scientist. It's not really about science. It's about how you look at the world. And my last two sentences of my book state, one of the most meaningful insights that I have acquired along my life's journey is that it takes the same amount of energy to complain as it does to exclaim, but the results are incredibly different. Learning to exclaim instead of to complain has been my most valuable lesson. Thank you.